Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Handwoven, Piecework, Spinoff, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. I'm your host, co founder Ann Merrow. This season is sponsored by Webs. Webs, America's yarn store, is your source for everything you need for your next weaving project. Webs carries a wide selection of yarns, looms, tools, and accessories, and you can save up to 25% every day with the Webs discount. Visit yarn.com for more info. For this episode, I spoke with Kenya Miles, an artist, natural dyer, and urban farmer. Although I first found her on Instagram as Traveling Miles, she's based in Baltimore, Maryland, where she's an artist in residence with the Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA. We spoke in spring 2021 when her project, Blue Light Junction, was just planning in-person workshops. So Kenya, thanks for taking some time out of growing season to be with us. (laughs) Thanks for having me. What do you have in the ground? Well, um, there's there's so many things in the ground at this point, um, thankfully, because I was very uncertain uh, what that might look like. Um, but we are sort of, I'm in a number of natural dye farming spaces. And so it's been interesting. There's a project that is essentially overseeing five natural dye gardens, farms, um, within the Baltimore urban agriculture space. And so We have all kinds of plants growing from um, matter root to obviously like our indigo. We are doing sunflowers and calendula and marigolds and just sort of thinking about colors and pigments, but also medicinal um, properties. And at the garden that I tend with Rosa Chang, we're at Hidden Harvest, we're sort of doing again like cotton, you know, so also thinking about fiber, um, flax, and things like that. And we have a pretty robust amount of sort of self-seeded coreopsis and cosmos and the amaranth has come back really strong this year. So yeah, many, many, many things. I love this idea of hidden harvest. What what is hidden harvest? I'm, I'm picturing like this secret gardens in the city of Baltimore. It definitely is a secret in that um, it's it's sort of in this four-way alley. And unless you are a pedestrian who uses that pathway a lot or car, you know, uh, there are people who have lived in that neighborhood for, you know, 15, 20 years and have never gone through that alley. And so um, it's pretty surprising to some of our neighbors that uh, last year were able to explore it as we were sort of um, extending the opportunity for people to come and spend time in the garden. So Hidden Harvest is a garden that has been sort of this active space for well over a decade um, through a lot of different hands. Um, Some of those neighbors and elders, some of them in its sort of new iteration in the last eight years or so was through students at the Maryland Institute College of Art. And so taking it in as um, an active um, adopt a lot uh, and also just sort of stewarding that and growing vegetables. Um, And so there are two plots that are split by an alley. One is um, where they have veggies and chickens and there was an apiary that hopefully will come back into um, formation. But on the other side is where our dye garden is and that we call the annex. So that is sort of a full space uh, in between four different streets, essentially. How did you develop the expertise to grow all of these different plants? Well, I think there there is no expertise like experience. So I do not consider myself an expert. I just consider myself an advocate and a person who's really interested in learning. And so when there's something that I want to uh, endeavor, I just spend time with it. And I think about that also in thinking about values, you know, sort of internally or personal relationships. Like if there's something that I want to have a deeper connection to that I just have to sit with it. And so that's really how I've learned and had the opportunity to to really be able to do that in a way that supports me financially, which is such a gift. Um, and also to be able to do it in sort of a residency mode, where as an artist, I can ask a lot of different questions about things and sort of take a little bit more time to explore those things without, you know, necessarily needing certain results. 
because you have both farmer and artist as part of your bio. Which came first, the farmer or the artist for you? Hmm. That's a very wonderful question and also deeply based in legacy because, you know, my family are historically farmers, as I think many people who are of African descent or, you know, immigrants, we're sort of all in this space where we, you know, we were people of the land. And and so for me, looking back in that lineage, I would say I was a farmer first. As, you know, my own life and experience has evolved, I was definitely an artist from a very, very young age. And so I spent, you know, childhood and up until this point, um, just nurturing that part of myself and really thinking more about growing and planting when I was living in Northern California. Um, And culturally, there are a lot of earth-based practices and sort of ways of living, especially in the Bay Area. And so just wanting to take that on and having this gift of this really beautiful like backyard garden space that had seven fruit trees and space to grow um, food. And so that's really where I started to grow dye plants and food um, myself. And your your Instagram handle and the sort of the, the name that you go under is sometimes called Traveling Miles. And right now you literally have put down roots. What's that like? Yeah, well, it's been interesting. Obviously, we're still in whatever, you know, the, this global pandemic is. And One of the things that has been halted for me personally is travel. And so that has been a really interesting way to sort of look at myself because I do consider myself a practicing traveler. Like it's something that's really important to my perspective, my way of experiencing other people and other things. And so I think that the traveling sort of part and setting roots have, you know, been in a way just sort of commingling in a space that feels really good. Whereas, you know, in other places that I've lived, I've been more transient. Um, I've been more traveling and actively so like taking four plus months every year to live in another country and just consistently sort of traveling throughout the U.S., I think that now I'm interested to see like what the balance of really having deep roots in a place and then also being able to take flight and and sort of expand a little bit in in that there's so many things that are similar in so many places um, and to be able to reflect that back into the work. You listed about 10 different dye plants. Do you have a favorite dye process? Um. You know, I don't know, like as far as processing the plants to have pigment or just uh, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm asking this because I first met you working on our Nature's Colorways book that was iron and tannin. And so, you know, the, the plants that you just mentioned are are more colorful. And the one we initially talked about was black. So uh, I'm just wondering what what do you do you have a favorite? Like, yeah, a favorite way to process. I I don't necessarily I'm a pretty simple dyer if that if that makes sense like I enjoy obviously there's a certain level of commitment when you're um, a natural dyer versus using industrial chemical dyes and so I have my sort of expanse of you know steps techniques practices that I commit to but as far as like getting plants um, as they're growing and using them I really just like to dry plants, you know, I like to dry them and store them and use them for later. I'm pretty like low maintenance and I'm not sure if that's because my hands are in a number of things and it's just the easiest thing to do. But in our indigo extraction process, one of the things that Rosa Chang has really been working on is the water extraction process. And ultimately, it's a labor of love. You know, it's a multi-day, multi-step process and, you know, can go into a week. And then when you have multiple harvests throughout the seasons with multiple farms and that collection process, it can be really intense. So we sort of, it's like warriors preparing for, you know the the big sort of crescendo of a battle like we're in that space where you know you know it's coming and you're sort of trying to prepare yourself um, energetically because it's a 
it's sort of a, a monster to get over. But, you know, I'm a big, I've been growing cotton. This will be the third season. And, you know, I, not on a grand scale, but I really, really connect deeply with the cotton plants in a way that I hadn't really expected to. And so I just, you know, love the sort of life of the plant as it's growing and, you know, picking the the bowls at the end, uh, you know, of their sort of time when they've opened up, like that's very gratifying for me. And it's really simple, you know. So yeah, we just have a lot of cotton sitting around, but I don't, I don't really need to do anything with it. It's just beautiful. You know? I'm not sure people realize how beautiful cotton plants are or how widely they, like you can plant them in Michigan, you can plant them in New Mexico. Yeah, there's so many varieties um, and so many like heritage cottons that we sort of have let die out or, you know, people are as they are with corn, really looking back at like the the cotton that we grow is Sea Island brown and it's just a natural, really light kind of camely brown. And to me, those sort of colorways just speak to a lot of the sort of richness of the earth and how little work then needs to be done in dyeing or coloring or what colors you can get by using that as a base color as opposed to like an American sort of white cotton. So yeah, it's it's pretty amazing, like also to understand that, you know, not only were many of the the groups of people who were farming cotton colonized, but the plants as well, you know, really. And I think we sort of separate ourselves because of someone else's decision about something. And so I think just growing it myself has been Right, like a practice and a healing that I really wasn't looking for, but feel really grateful to be able to be present in that. It's also amazing how, in some ways, the natural color wants to come back. So what took you to Baltimore? Well, I am from the East Coast. So I was born in Washington, D.C., raised between Fort Washington, Maryland, PG County, and, you know, went back and forth to high school in in Washington and D.C. And so I think my travels sort of led me to live in New York for nine years and then sort of take a couple of years throughout Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and then um, was just kind of looking for a similar environment, was definitely over winters and um, hadn't, I think, had a winter in like four years at that point. And so was just kind of chasing the sun, I think. And so California, for me, made sense because it was Mexico, you know. So <laughs> I thought, well, that's a place I can go and earn money without having any relationships out there, any, you know, sort of specific thing that I was going to do. And so I think that that ultimately was an experience that taught me a lot and gave me a lot of richness and a lot of, I would say, like time to focus on myself, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like on the East Coast, you know, now it's a little bit more uh, hip, but, you know, you're like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, take time for myself. And people are like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, it's time for that. You know, there's always an agenda, I would say, um, in at least the cities that I lived in, in the East Coast. And so I just felt like it was very natural to sort of be in isolation and sort of be in nature and to be, you know, sort of having that intermix throughout your day versus like, we're going to go out, you know, for this walk for an hour. Like, you know, you just would amble to the beach. You would amble to um, the the Redwoods or, you know, just very much integrated. And so it gave me a lot of that, but I felt very isolated in a way that I don't on the East Coast. And so I made the choice to bring my family back to the East Coast, we have, my parents are here, you know, I have a young son. So for me, there were a lot of pluses as far as like hands-on support, but just a different way of integrating. But I I also didn't, you know, DC had changed so much. I really wasn't feeling like that was a place I wanted to land back. And we've had friends, I've had friends in Baltimore from New York for many, many years. So Yeah, it just felt like the time to kind of come a lot of other people from other places that I knew were also looking at Baltimore. So that was how we landed here. And 
I was surprised at how strong a program Micah seems to have in natural dyes. Yeah, this, for all intents and purposes, Micah had, to my knowledge, a program that integrated through certain, like a semester of some natural dye practices, but it didn't have a natural dye curriculum. And I think that was through either their foundation fiber or something like that. So when this project, the Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative, was created through uh, the First Lady of the State, um, Yumi Hogan, you know, Maryland State's Arts Council, Micah was brought in as a partner to look at curricular work. Um, also, the First Lady has taught at Micah for many years. And so I think a lot of that was really integrating the space that Micah holds in this city, surely, you know, it's like Micah and Johns Hopkins are like the two sort of towering uh, academic powers here and really looking at the access that Micah has, whether that's like the space um, in their fibers department or sort of the the outreach and, and interest to just focus more on what that means and that was really under the the stewardship of two really strong leaders, um, Piper Shepard and Valeska Popolo, really looking at ways that they could explore the historical and the present sort of practices of natural dyes um, and what those histories have, have lent us. Are you affiliated with MICA? Yeah, so I was also um, asked to join that project. So that's really how a lot of the things that opened up for me, I always and we'll consistently say that being a natural dyer is like being a poet. You know, it's it's not the easiest way to make a living, but also the opportunities are sort of nuanced and different. And so when we moved here about nine months after we moved here, I was teaching a workshop at Neighborhood Fiber Company, which is a local yarn company in the city. And it was a natural dye class. And so Piper and Valeska attended that workshop and sort of connected me to this opportunity that was coming up in 2019. And so through um, sort of relationship building and, and conversations, I was asked to come on board as an artist in residence for the 18 month duration of the project. It's interesting because when I think about fiber in Baltimore, I think about you and I also think about Neighborhood Fiber Company, which is local, but also has has far reaches across the country. So who helps you in these in these gardens that you work on? Are there people that you meet through MICA? Are they individual, you know, artists? So the garden um, that we grow at Hidden Harvest was sort of this culmination of like ideas or this collective of ideas where myself, Rosa Chang, and uh, Piper and Valeska were all interested equally in starting a natural dye garden. And so um, I had moved to the the neighborhood where the garden is located in Greenmount West and was really, had already been talking to the original manager of the garden about doing it in 2018. So at the end of the season, um, I hadn't done it. And talking to them about the project, I said, oh, I would love to have a a natural dye garden. There's this place up the street from where I live. And they're like, oh, that's amazing. Because we also just asked the person who was stewarding the land, but has moved away, like if we could have some space to do it. Rose is also really interested in doing that. So it was very serendipitous that we all um, wanted the opportunity, knowing that there would be a state funded project where, you know, that they would have specific guidelines around, you know, yield and what they needed and, you know, just practices. We wanted a much more sort of like artistic space to explore native plants and a lot of varying um, practices and processing. So that really, I feel like is how a lot of that came together. And the people who have come to, to support that have been the students who ran through this three-semester class, Natural Dyes as Intercultural Connector, which um, was facilitated by Valeska. But also within that, it was a community class. So it wasn't just students from MICA. It was elders in the community. It was culture bearers. It was, you know, other uh, educators who were interested, curators. So there was this really open space that presented a really beautiful dynamic um, amongst all of us. And ultimately, those are the people who sort of add ripples to, to the other people who come, you know, like the more people sort of 
get wind of it, the, the, we get kind of all people from all over, whether they're students, whether they're neighbors who are in Greenmount, whether they're people who um, are coming in from Chesapeake or from D.C. or, you know, so that's been a really wonderful. And every Saturday, you know, 12 to 3, we have open volunteer hours. You just never know who's going to be at the garden. So do you tend to use those dye plants for your own work or is growing the dye plants a little bit separate from your own art? Yeah, I sort of am in a space where I was not necessarily taken aback, but I thought it was really funny. At the end of the season in the winter, I was having some volunteers help me start some seeds and just to check germination for the cotton and indigo that we were planning to sell for the season. And you know, one of the volunteers was like, so like, do you, you know, what do you do? Like, do you do any dyeing? And I just thought it's so funny because do I? Like, I am literally supporting a number of endeavors. And so my own practice has been really stalled in, in that way. And, and I don't feel I have been advised in a really wonderful way by other artists who are um, more senior in their practice and their careers to make sure that I make time for my art and make sure that I make time for that exploration because there is real beauty and dignity and, you know, honor to like facilitating all of these spaces so that other people, you know, can also work and do the things that they feel compelled to do. But there's also still your voice and the things that you're, you know, being touched by. And so, I I try to kind of come in and out every year and generally it's it's in the winter where I can spend a little more time um focusing summer and spring are really hard times to do any work for myself though I was able to last year take Abu Bokar Fofana's online workshop through botanical colors on mud printing, which had been a long standing like desire of mine and was only really accessible because I wasn't, you know, I didn't have to travel and I didn't have to, you know, pay like a in person rate, like the, you know, just some positive stuff about being online. But yeah, I, I sort of have those pieces kind of tucked away and really plan to spend a little more time with them as as the season allows. <laughs> That sounds really familiar uh, as somebody who started off as a reader and went into publishing and then and then became a knitter and moved into knitting publishing. There's a sort of a parallel profession phenomenon where you, you know, you wind up spending a whole lot of energy on something that's running parallel to where you started. And it's, sometimes it's hard to get back. Yeah. 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 And I, I do see the the need for both. And I think that, you know, not really resenting one, you know, it's like really just this natural flow. And if you can find, and I, and I say that with optimism, it doesn't mean that I found it. I'm just, you know, I, I think that there is harmony that can be had and just looking to be able to, you know, as things get more foundationally set with Blue Light Junction and the garden, just to be able to say like, okay, now I can take the time I need to just like make art, you know. So I was going to ask you about Blue Light Junction. I noticed that that's a a project that you are working in. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah. So Blue Light Junction is a natural dye studio that I founded in 2020, just before the pandemic began. It is a processing center, a natural dye facility, workshop space, educational space, alternative color lab, and it runs adjacent to the Hidden Harvest Annex. So we're also facilitating different practices through Blue Light Junction, as well as, you know, through direct garden access. And is that someplace that you are working with other artists or are you planning to have classes there? How do you see that developing? One of the ways that I see Blue Light Junction developing is through a a lens of cooperative use. Uh, So the space right now um, is really fundamentally supported by my own work and the things that I'm able to do to basically like pay the bills. Um, But really the space, I'm looking to have a collaboration of multiple artists, individuals who want to teach workshops, 
um, which would be in the facility is a 2,400 square foot space. Through a relationship with MICA and other Baltimore organizations, we were given a grant for $200,000 to build out the facility. So really what I would like to see it fundamentally operate as is a place where people see sort of the use and uh, expression of botanical colors, botanicals through medicinal, sort of different ways to utilize those things and ultimately be kind of a cultural center for traditional practices through natural dyes and, and other things. That sounds amazing. All of a sudden, I I have this urge to just, you know, come come to Baltimore, which I think of as the city, (laughs) but to to learn more about natural dyes, this sort of traditional heritage expression. Yeah, we'd love to have you. We're definitely um, just getting our sea legs with sort of the pandemic keeping us from in-person exchanges. And so at some point we'll do yeah, we'll, we're looking for July to be our sort of starting month for in-person workshops, which is really exciting. That is exciting. You were talking about a while back, you were talking about the isolation in, in Northern California and, and moving back to the East Coast where things are, you know, closer by. But then all of a sudden, uh, how has it been for you over the last year to be working on a community project? Well, for us, uh, I would say we established greater community because people were stuck with us, you know, we were stuck with each other. Um, And really, when you understand fundamentally that you are all that you have, that you are all each other's business, that I think we were able to really build a place of safety and sanctuary for people um, who were, you know, locked in their homes, uh, you know, with more time than they desired to either be in stillness with themselves or with their, you know, loved ones, you know, I I think that a lot of it gave people a really wonderful access point to like a breath of fresh air or communing with new people, having conversations in ways that you're, you're being told you can't access outside of a certain group, but we were consistently outdoors and also the studio as of yet isn't built up. So we had a lot of open space to commune and sort of engage in that way. And I think a lot of it was really beneficial to putting into perspective what we needed, you know, and what we needed was to listen and to be present with one another and to really learn from these sort of small ways of experiencing connection versus the bigger, like, we're having a show, it's going to be a, you know, an event or there's going to be, right? And all of those things have a buildup, but they're very fleeting. And, you know, if you're in the garden for a couple of hours, all you are is there, you know? And I was just reading an article recently about the idea of the reclaimed community garden about, you know, starting off with seed bombs and and transforming your urban space into something that's that's more natural and where do you folks find the land or how do you get permission to farm on in your urban spaces? Well, Baltimore has a really strong urban agriculture uh, culture. And so I really came into that through my close friend, Jenga, who has an urban garden in New Orleans. And so having watched her for, you know, many, many years sort of in these spaces and Um, When she was visiting, actually, I came to know Eric Jackson, who is uh, the founder of Cherry Hill Black Yield Institute, and really just came to sort of slowly understand through the collective of farmers at the Farm Alliance, which is an organization that brings farmers together and also allows them resources to grants to understand more about space, anything that they're sort of in need of. And fundamentally, people outside of that network who are also really in strong community spaces like Plantation Park Heights and Filbert Street Garden. Like there's all of these people who I think I'm just looking at the models that they have laid down for generations, you know, sometimes. And there are, you know, adopt a lot programs. And so we just kind of came into the space already having been a center of growing and But I do look forward to the idea and the opportunity to grow in different spaces that have yet to be sort of seen as 
a place for urban agriculture and just sort of looking to set some spaces that feel like being wild in the city, you know, like there are these really, I think, essential spaces where you don't necessarily want to go 20, 30 minutes out to touch a plant or touch a tree or be in nature. Like, I think that all of those things can fundamentally exist in our cities. And so rewilding like the landscapes is really a big uh, moniker of Blue Light Junction's work. So if people are interested in becoming part of your project, you have open volunteer days and also Blue Light Junction has a has a web presence. Yeah, we're at bluelightjunction.com. We're also on Instagram at blue.lightjunction. As well, uh, our open volunteer hours are every Saturday, 12 to 3. There's no sort of skill level necessary, nor do you have to have a specific goal. You can just come and be at the garden. Um, And the garden is open to anyone 24 hours a day. So you can also just be a part of just physically being in the space. That's really um, also really important to us too. Well, thanks so much, Kenya. I will let you get back to your farm, which I hope has been growing as we speak. Thank you so much, Anne. I look forward to um, sharing more as we continue to grow. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.